Greetings, dear brothers and sisters. In the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, our Messiah, our soul sustainer, our bread giver, and our all in all, Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once again, to Messiah and Messiah alone be all the praise, honor, and glory. And today is the second day, right, David? Yes. Yeah, today is the second day, a second day of the fourth month of the year 2021, dear brothers and sisters. And today, as we are in this ordained week, week which Messiah ordained for us, the week which changed our lives forever, the week of agony of a happy love, eternity decided in six hours by your compassionate Creator on that Roman cross. We will never know the extremes, incredible extremes our Messiah went on our behalf. We will never know the price, the cost, the transaction above every transaction which Messiah paid on that Roman cross for my filth, for our sins and the sin of the entire world. We will never know it, dear brothers and sisters. Today, as, as we go through this week, the week of agony of agape love, Eternity decided in six hours by your compassionate creator on that Roman cross. We once again, we thank you for being a part of this week. We thank you that once again, it is Messiah's Ruach, dear brothers and sisters, who unifies us and gives us this exalted privilege in this time to once again exalt, honor and glorify him. Ishmaqobot, the man of sorrows, the one who bore it all. Cursed is he, the Torah says, cursed is he who hangs on that tree. And it was my sin, my curse, which he bore, my wrath, which he drank, our wrath. What an amazing, amazing, amazing God we serve. Today, David has, our eight-year-old son David has a song for us. We'll, we'll use the karaoke for above all. Today, let us once again. Remember the incredible extremes our Messiah went on our behalf. And today we'll take a look as Messiah leads us a deeper look at the excruciating pain and agony, the incredible extremes, at least from our limited understanding. We'll take a look at what Messiah underwent for us. And today David has a song for us. Above all, we'll use the karaoke for that. Let us sing together. But before that let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us bow our hearts. Let us bow our heads. And let us ask Messiah once again. Let us thank him. Let us thank him for the incredible extremes he had gone on our behalf. Thanking the Lord should be for life eternal. And not, all, not for our materialistic things here only. It's life eternal. It's eternity which Messiah settled on that Roman cross. With his excruciating death. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us bow our hearts. Let us bow our heads. And let us today truly, truly once again honor, exalt our reigning, our risen King Yeshua HaMashiach. So let's go to the Lord in prayer because Messiah must increase. Messiah Ishmaqobot, the man of sorrows, our great God and Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, must increase. We must decrease. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Shall we, David? Yes. All right. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Holy Father, as we come in your mighty presence, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength, with all our soul, with our entire being, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that thou art our God and you have redeemed us and you have redeemed us through the precious, priceless, holy blood of our Messiah, your only begotten son, Yeshua HaMashiach. We cannot even begin to imagine. We cannot even begin to imagine. Lord, the extremes you have gone on our behalf. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that thou art our God. We thank you, Lord, that you have not left us alone and desolate. But you came and you redeemed us with your precious, priceless, holy blood. Oh, Holy Father, here we stand humbled and in awe at the incredible, unimaginable extremes that you have gone on our behalf that we can have life and life eternal. We come before your throne, grateful and thankful that we have the opportunity to do so. We ask, Holy Father, that if it is your mighty will, 
If it is your mighty will, as we bring each and every single of our dear fellow brethren in your mighty presence, that you, if you would reveal, reveal to each one of us, to every single of our dear fellow brethren, your only begotten son, Yeshua HaMashiach, because this is eternal life to keep on knowing our great God and Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. We pray, Lord, we pray, Father, that if you would please reawaken in each one of us and every single of our dear fellow brethren an awareness of your word and an awareness of the incredible gift that you have given us. Thank you for this agape love letter in Yeshua HaMashiach. We just praise you, we just praise you, we just praise you, Lord. This love letter that was written in the blood on wooden cross, on that wooden cross erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. Oh, Holy Father, help us today to realize that no matter what our problems are, that we need to bring it to the foot of Calvary, foot of that cross. But above all, Father, we bring our lives before you. Today we bring every single of our dear fellow brethren before you. We pray that you would receive us not for any merit that we have, for we confess before you that we are indeed sinners, Lord, as you have revealed to each one of us through your Ruach. That we are truly in the shoes of Barabbas. That you would receive, Holy Father. You would receive each one of us only by the eternal work done by your only begotten, done by your only begotten Son, our Messiah, our Lord, our King, our Melech. Yeshua HaMashiach, we thank you, we thank you, O Holy Father, that you have chosen by your infinite grace to provide a substitute so that we might be free from the law of sin and death. We pray, O Holy Father, once again, that if you would receive our true confession and peace, please grant, please grant us repentance, Lord, that you would create in each one of us a clean heart, a humble heart, a heart that bathes for you and you alone, Lord. And would give us a renewed sense of commitment to you. As we come in your presence, Lord. As we honor you. As we sing for you, Lord. As we hear your word, Lord. Today, once again, we anoint every alphabet which comes out of our mouths, Lord. Once again, Lord. Through us, it is impossible. Through our flesh, it is impossible to praise you, Lord. Help us, Lord. Because you said true worship is done in spirit and in truth, Lord. And there is no truth. There is no truth in any one of us except our Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach because He is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. And your word is truth. Oh, Holy Father, today help us, Lord. Pour out your spirit once again. Pour out your Ruach, Lord, so that we can praise you in spirit and in truth, Lord. Help us today, Lord. Help us today, Lord, to praise you, to honor you, to glorify you. Through us it is impossible. But your word says, Matthew 19, 26, that... Through you, everything, Lord, everything is possible. So today, we I bring David and myself, Lord, in your presence once again and pray, Lord, today. Please be our strength and our weakness. As we came on Psalm 141, verse 3, and pray, Father, that please do set a guard over our mouths and keep watch over the door of our lips as we convey thy message, Lord, to thy appointed people once again. Oh, Holy Father, guide us and lead us in the light through your Ruach, Ruach HaKadosh, and ignite in each and every single of our dear fellow brethren, and ignite in each one of us a hunger for your word, for thee and thy word, for the word and word incarnate, and draw us into the pages of the text that we might better understand in the days that remain. At least get a glimmer of just the magnitude, the magnitude of your love, your mighty love, your holy love, your pure love, your sacrificial love for each one of us. Help us, Lord, through the ministry of Ruach HaKodesh to respond to the Degapi love by obedience to the grace that you have extended to us. We thank you, Holy Father, once again with all our heart. And we commit ourselves, every single of our dear fellow brethren, into thy mighty hands at this time, Lord. For this week, the week of agony, of a happy love, eternity decided in six hours by your compassionate creator on that Roman cross. We surrender every single of our dear fellow brethren into thy mighty hands without any reservation whatsoever. In the name above every single name of our holy redeemer, Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our Lord, our Savior, our soul sustainer, our breath giver, and our all in all. Amen. Amen. And amen and amen. And today, once again, dear brothers and sisters, David, as a song for us, we'll do the karaoke for above all, above all. 
Please join us, dear brothers and sisters. Let us once again, let us once again revisit, revisit the extremes our Messiah went on our behalf, not only on that cross, but every single day. Psalm 69 gives us the glimpse of every single day. Messiah suffered and suffered in ways which we cannot imagine. So today, let's use our best voices. Please join us. Let's sing together. Let us honor and glorify and give him the glory. To him belongs all the glory, honor and praise. The Bible says, Revelation 4, 11, that Messiah and Messiah alone is worthy of all the praise, all the honor and all the glory. And today, let us sing together. And you can please go ahead, David. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Oh. 
Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We just praise you, we just praise you, we just praise you, we just praise you. Glory, 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 glory to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to the name above every single name. He took the fall so that we, the fallen ones, don't have to Spend our eternity in the lake of fire. We will never know what it means. Like a rose trampled on the ground. He lived to die. Today we don't understand. When we see Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son was given. Those are two different instances, dear brothers and sisters. The child was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the house of bread. The child was born in Bethlehem, but the son was given on Golgotha, on Calvary. On Calvary, on the same spot where Hashem commanded Abraham, where the word love, Ahava, is used first time in the scripture, Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, that Abraham take the son whom you love. And sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. The altitude is said to be seven, seven, seven meters. And Abraham, no questions asked, no questions asked, took his son and went to that mountain. And he was about to sacrifice him. But the voice of an angel came and stopped him. But 2,000 years later, another father sacrificed his only begotten son. And this time there was no voice. Only the son was crying out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We will never know the extremes, dear brothers and sisters. Our Messiah went on our behalf. Ever. We will never, ever know. To the full extent on this side of eternity. But today, let's take a deeper look, dear brothers and sisters. Let's take a deeper look from our finite understanding. From our limited knowledge. Let's take a deeper look at the excruciating suffering. Just the physical aspect of it. Just the physical aspect of it. Because we truly suspect that the physical aspect was very tiny and meager. Compared to... The aspect which we do not even understand that he who knew no sin was made sin for you and me so that you and me can become the righteousness of God. We are so soaked in sin we don't understand what it is for Messiah our great God and Lord the creator of heaven and earth to become sin. We have no idea. But today let us understand. Let's take a deeper look just at the excruciating suffering of Messiah. And the last day of his life from our limited understanding. So in the garden of Gethsemane, remember Messiah prayed to our holy heavenly father in emotional agony. And we see Dr. Luke as the physician. He tells us a little more. He takes us into the, the physiological, the anatomical, the medical aspect of it. So he tells us that he prayed with such honest passion that he sweated drops of blood. Have you ever known somebody who prayed so honestly that he sweated drops of blood? Luke chapter 22 verse 44 records that in being in agony he prayed more honestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Can we understand that? Do we think this is allegory? Because that's the problem today dear brothers and sisters. Allegorizing the scriptures. We truly think that the Bible is literal. And yes, please, once again, do not misunderstand us that there are figures of speech. Rhetorical devices, Lord has used. There are, there are over, I believe, at least, at least over 200 of different rhetorical devices which Hashem has used in His Word. But the Word of God is literal. 
the more literally we take it dear brothers and sisters the more ruach kodesh will sanctify us we may find it extremely hard to understand that what manner of prayer results into great drops of blood perhaps we may write it off as hyperbole but it is not it is not hyperbole yeshua hamashiach truly did sweat drops of blood great drops of blood falling to the ground we understand from the biomedical science point of view that there is a condition called hematohydrosis hematohydrosis and that's again a fancy term the hematohydrosis is nothing the heme has to do with blood we know that blood has hemoglobin and those are basically two proteins once again heme and globin the heme has the iron com component in it so the heme has to do basically with the blood and hydrosis refers to the water or sweat so it's a medical condition in which people actually sweat blood it's a very 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 rare condition but it occurs under severe emotional or severe physical stress and the results of hematohydrosis can be a significant loss of blood it certainly contributed to the process of dehydration that messiah suffered that night and the day following we can indeed be assured of the fact that messiah was not sweating blood because he was afraid of the cross that's blasphemy the captain of our salvation was not afraid of the cross he lived to die he came for that reason unto us a child is born unto us a son was given the captain of our salvation was not afraid of the physical aspect of the cross that was not the reason we believe that messiah was deeply anxious about being separated from our holy heavenly father for the first time in all of eternity as well as the heaviness the weight of the sins of the entire world hashem could not look upon messiah when the sins of the world were placed on him that day we cannot even begin to imagine what it means dear brothers and sisters we cannot even begin to imagine and soon after that after the great drops when he was sweating the, the blood sweat the hematohydrosis soon after that messiah was arrested and they mistreated him the creator of heaven and earth throughout the morning he was first struck during his trials after the trials the soldiers mocked him and beat him up and that's nothing to just skip over they covered his head with either a blindfold or a sack and they begin to beat him in the face Luke 22 was a 63 and 64 because now the men who held Messiah mocked him and beat him and having blindfolded him they struck him on the face and asked him saying prophesy who is the one who struck you a beating like that can be very traumatic to a human being one can be horribly battered about in the face if you don't have the ability to move and dodge the beatings can be devastating one's eyelid can be completely swollen shut and later they literally can have just a slit to see through the facial skin can be split open and the muscles damaged a beating like that by strong roman soldiers could have resulted in terrible disfigurement of messiah's face remember what isaiah prophesied about messiah's face would be so marred so this figure that he would no longer even look like human we cannot imagine dear brothers and sisters we cannot imagine Isaiah says Isaiah 52 verses 14 and 15 just as many were astonished at you so his visage was marred his face was disfigured more than any man and his form more than the sons of men so shall he sprinkle many nations kings shall shut their mouths at him for what had not been told then they shall see and what they had not heard they shall consider so this verse alone once again implies that our adonai's face would be so damaged so damaged so damaged that he would be almost unrecognizable depending on how many times they hit him and how hard no wonder after resurrection people were having hard time mary magdalene had a hard time recognizing messiah a road to emmaus remember dear brothers and sisters cleopas and his friend had a hard time his disciples were having a hard time i wonder why was that we don't expect dear brothers and sisters the roman soldiers exercise any mercy 
They hated the Jews and our Adonai was supposed to be their king. We read, as a matter of fact, in Matthew 27 verses 29 and 30, that after they scourged Messiah, they mocked him as king. And at this point, they crammed a crown of thorns on his head and beat him in the head with a reed. The crown of thorns would have caused more pain, more blood loss, and more disfigurement of Messiah, our Adonai, our Lord's face. At this time, as a matter of fact, the Jews did not have the legal right to condemn a man to death. When Rome assigned the first prefect, I believe that was Coponius, to province of Judea in AD 6, in 6 AD, he was given the power of life and death. The Jews did not submit to this new master easily, by the way. A certain Judas from the city of Gamala, which today is called as Go Golan Heights, led a revolt declaring that the taxation from Rome was little better than slavery. This revolt is, as a matter of fact, mentioned in Acts I believe Acts 537 by Gamaliel, the Pharisee Gamaliel. In short, the power over life and death, the power to carry out capital punishment was taken away from the Jewish Sanhedrin when Coponius was given charge to the province. So this is why Messiah had to be taken to Pontius Pilate. We read that the scribes and the Pharisees, we read in the scriptures that insisted that Messiah be crucified. Despite Pilate's repeated efforts to free him, right? So Pilate then, he washed his hands of the affair and allowed Messiah to be taken off to be executed. The New Testament writers, of course, do not great, go into a greater detail on either Messiah's scourging or his crucifixion. It wasn't a nice thing to write about, certainly. But the people of that day of the Bible times were familiar with scourging and crucifixion. They didn't need a description. In our day, we no longer nail malefactors to the crosses and stand them up as examples to warning to others. We need some explanation to appreciate what Messiah went through that day, dear brothers and sisters, because we truly do not understand today what it is. The scourging, what is it? Let's take a look about, let's try to understand about scourging. It was the Roman tradition to flog the victim before he was crucified. This punishment involved the use of a whip that had several leather thongs, usually about 18 to 24 inches long, with bits of metal bone or glass embedded in the le leather thongs. And historians tell us that they would sometimes use an iron rod instead of the leather thongs, but it is hard to say which would be worse. Either one was terrible. The Jewish custom was to lash a prisoner 39 times as a form of mercy, according to Deuteronomy 25.3. But the Romans apparently had no such limit. And the scriptures don't tell us how many times Messiah was beaten. But we know enough about Roman scourging to garner a good idea of the damage they inflicted. The effects of the flogging alone would have been staggering, dear brothers and sisters. Many people died just as a result of Roman floggings due to shock and blood loss. The skin and the muscles would literally be shredded into thin ribbons of flesh. Muscle would hang out the back. And as a result, the back would resemble something worse than a hamburger. And that's true, dear brothers and sisters. Physiologically, the results of scourging were catastrophe. It would have severely weakened and traumatized the human body, allowing the victim very little strength for what was left ahead. And after the scourging, what happened? Messiah was mocked and fitted with a crown of spikes. At this point, it had been almost nine hours since Messiah was arrested. Messiah had not had anything to drink since the night before. And the com combination of the sweat, the beatings, the thorns and the scourging would have set into motion an irreversible process of severe dehydration, cardiac and respiratory failure. All of this was done so that the prophecies of the book of Psalms and as Isaiah prophet, Isaiah prophesied would be fulfilled. Psalm 129 verse 3 says something very, very disturbing. The plowers plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. The plowers plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. Psalm 22, 15 says, my strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. 
we today don't understand tongue clinging to the jaws because we don't understand the amazing mechanism God has through all the saliva and everything how our mouth is kept moist all the enzymes working there and the different mechanism we don't truly get to appreciate that because we take it for granted but Messiah was so dehydrated Messiah cries out my strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws you have brought me to the dust of death Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6 I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5. We are so well versed with it. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for my transgressions, for our transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities, for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by Messiah's stripes, the beating, the scourging, the flogging, we are healed. The marks left, left by the whip were called stripes. And so we find the Old Testament references to stripes when whipping was involved. In the book of Psalms, the stripes are described with the more brutal metaphor of furrows, which gives us an idea of the depth of the marks. We also get a sense of Messiah's exhaustion and dehydration from Psalm 22. Messiah's strength was dried up and his tongue stuck to his jaws. At that point, Messiah was crucified. He was already severely weakened. He would have lost a lot of blood. The damage to his back would be virtually irreparable. As a matter of fact, Simon of Cyrene had to be forced to help Messiah by carrying his cross because it was clear that Messiah wasn't able to bear it himself. Matthew 27, 32, Mark 15, 21 is an authority. The process of crucifixion, as a matter of fact, was invented by the Persians. I believe it was between 300 and 400 BC. It was perfected by the Romans who used it extensively starting about the first century BC. It is among the most painful and hideous deaths ever invented by mankind and it was reserved for the most vicious of criminals now let us understand about the cross the cross there is an array of confusing ideas of course about the crucifixion that we need to truly understand for instance there are those who argue over what messiah's cross actually looked like Ultimately, what matters once again, dear brothers and sisters, is that Messiah died an excruciating, brutal death for my sins, for your sins, for our sins. And the shape of the cross isn't as important as the fact that Messiah was crucified. Messiah died a brutal death on the cross. At the same time, the cross has become a symbol of Christianity. And it would be nice to know perhaps if the symbol we see somewhat resembles the cross of Messiah. So several New Testament translations refer to the cross as tree. We see Acts 5.30, Acts 10.39, 30, Acts chapter 13, verse 29, Galatians 3.13, 1 Peter 2.24 refers to the cross as a tree. And people have taught that Messiah was perhaps nailed to a living tree, one with branches and leaves. It is true that the Romans sometimes crucified people by nailing them to the trees but however the Greek word used in the New Testament is not dendron which is used 26 times in the New Testament as the word for a living tree the Greek word translated tree in reference to the crucifixion here used is zulon zulon which is better translated timber or wood and also we know that Simon of Cyrene was required required to carry our Adonai's cross whether the entire cross or the cross being we don't know, but so it's most likely that Messiah was cr crucified up on a timber. The New Testament writers use the word stauros, stauros for cross. And this has also caused some confusion. A stauros was a pole or post in classical Greek, but it was designed, but it, it was used to designate the Roman cross when Rome began crucifying people. So some people have argued that Messiah was crucified on a single post. But this doesn't stand up to the Bible's description or testimony from early Christian writers which indicate that Messiah was nailed to a cross with a crossbeam. 
First, the soldiers used nails to attach Messiah's hands to the cross rather than just one nail. According to the statement by Apostle Thomas in John chapter 20 verse 25. So a single nail would have driven through Messiah's hands if he were nailed to a pole or post. Just as a single nail was used to sec secure his feet to the post. But however, Messiah's hands were nailed up separately. And also all the church writers describe this. Describe the crosses of the day as upright with cross beams. And we can also, as a matter of fact, glean additional information about the crucifixion from the Passover story. When the Jews were told to smear the blood on the door, during the doorpost, during the first Passover, they were to strike blood on the two doorposts, as well as the lintel above the door, which we as Christians see as representing the outstretched arms and head of Messiah our Lord, our Adonai, Yeshua HaMashiach. Exodus 12, 22 tells us that, and you shall take a bunch of his hyssop, dip it in the blood that it is that that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. So it is true that there were different varieties of Roman crosses. They had a what was called the crux emissa, which consisted of a very heavy pole permanently affixed in the ground. This pole, the stipe, was roughly eight or nine feet tall, and a cross and a crossbar called patibulum was fit into the stipe. Emissa means inserted. This particular cross is familiar to us as the Latin cross, the symbol used in Christianity. Again, a variant of this was the crux commissa or tau cross, which was shaped like the Greek letter tau. Or T with the patibulum on top. The victim being crucified would be tied initially to the crossbar and escorted, humiliated through the crowds to the place of the crucifixion. There are many scholars, there are many scholars who think that Messiah was crucified on the Tau type of cross. While the Latin cross is the one we see typically depicted in painting, it didn't come into common use until the time of Messiah. That's what many scholars think. But yet the Latin cross would have had the room above Messiah's head to attach the pilot's titular declaring Yeshua HaMashiach, the king of the Jews. So the preparation, let's look at the understand what exactly happens at crucifixion. The preparation of the victim was a demeaning process. They would typically strip the victim naked and divide his clothes among the Roman soldiers. As a gesture of Roman mercy, the prisoner was often offered a mild and aesthetic mixture of vinegar and sometimes wine. The victim was then placed on his back, arms stretched out. The first step in the process of crucifixion was pinning his hands to the wooden crossbeam and piercing his hands and feet. Let us understand what Messiah went through that day, dear brothers and sisters. These are all things which have occurred which the creator of heaven and earth went through for you and me. He, it was not those nails which held him there. He could have any moment Messiah could have declared I'm out of here. I don't have to go through this. But it was his agape. Agape love for you and me which held him there. We cannot even begin to imagine what our Lord went through. The first step in the process of crucifixion was pinning his hands to the wooden crossbeam and piercing his hands and feet. When artists depict the crucifixion of Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, they often place the nails in the palms of his hands and good scholars are of the opinion oftentimes that they may not necessarily be correct and it could be due to common misunderstanding of the Greek word for hand. In our culture, hand is a very specific part of the anatomy. Once again, so there are various views where those nails pierced Messiah's hands. The Greek word, as a matter of fact, zeros, however, indicated the hand and wrist and sometimes the lower arm. So good scholars sometimes point to the fact that nails through the palms cannot hold the weight of the victim. And anatomical studies done on cadavers have shown that the body weight of the individuals have caused the nails to tear through the hands. So this is why we see these depictions of Yeshua HaMashiach with nails through his hands and ropes binding to the arms of the cross. However, ropes were, as a matter of fact, not necessary because executioners developed a more sophisticated technique. They took a long iron nail, six to eight inches long, and they hammered it in between the bones of the wrists. So there is a, sp a space between the carpal bones. 
through which a spike can fit without breaking any bones and the muscles and bones would have made a sturdy anchoring spot to hold the weight of the body. And archaeological findings oftentimes have pointed to the fact that the nails were perhaps placed at the wrists. Moreover, the bones of crucifixion victims have been found with nails still lodged in the middle of the wrists. But once again, irrespective, dear brothers and sisters, of the exact location of Messiah's hands where he was pierced with the nails, the most important point to remember that the Roman soldiers indeed nail Messiah's hands and feet to the cross. We cannot even begin to imagine just the physical agony associated with it. Let alone be the fact that at this point, even our Heavenly Father had to forsake Yeshua HaMashiach. The placement of the nail had several effects. First, it ensured that the victim would indeed hang on the cross until death. Second, the nail placed at this point would cut off the largest nerve in the hand, the median nerve. The median nerve basically travels down the forearm through the wrist into the hand through the carpal tunnel. And the carpal tunnel syndrome, as a matter of fact, is a common condition which we are aware of in which swelling results in pressure on or pinching of that median nerve. Basically, the swelling of the median nerve. So a crucifixion nail driven would virtually cut off the median nerve at this point. This would result in loss of muscle control of the hand, which would cause the hand to contract into a claw-like form because there is now no muscle control. The nerve is cut off. A tremendous searing, burning pain results when a nerve is cut off and it would have radiated up the arm to the neck. Most people believe that crucifixion victims died from bleeding to death and that's not necessarily true. Placing the nail in this position would have missed the two major arteries of the hand and very little bleeding as a matter of fact would have occurred at that point. A nail was also pounded through the feet. Now let us understand the staggering impact of how the feet were positioned when they were nailed. Nailing the feet to the cross was a critical part of the death process. Another nail, again six to eight inches long, would be nailed between the metatarsal bones in the midfoot area. First, however, the soldiers would bend the victim's knees at approximately 45 degrees and then flex the foot downward 45 degrees so that the foot was parallel to the upright post, the stipe. This means that when they were nailed in place, the feet in this position were virtually vertical. Both feet were attached to the wood with one nail. From the top of the feet through the soles and the feet were affixed in this position. The nails in the feet caused a lot more bleeding than the nails in the hands because there's a major artery. One of the two major arteries to the foot is called the dorsal, dorsal pedal artery, which runs right through the middle of the foot. So that artery was likely to be cut off by the process of crucifixion. And still the amount of bleeding was still not enough to cause somebody to bleed to death because generally that artery would co coagulate within a few minutes of the actual process. So the result of being pinned to the cross this way is absolutely terrifying, absolutely horrific. The victim was now stuck in an impossible position with his knees flexed at about 45 degrees. He had to, Messiah had to bear his weight with the muscles of the thigh, but this would have been an almost impossible task, trying to stand with your knees flexed at 45 degrees for five minutes. Let us try to stand once again, dear brothers and sisters, with our knees flexed at 45 degrees for five minutes. Our thighs, what will happen? will start burning severely. We won't be able to maintain that position and we will need to sit down. Sometimes, if Messiah leaves you, try that out, dear brothers and sisters, that when we try to flex our knees at 45 degrees, what happens? And this we are talking about after all the excruciating pain, the beating and, and all the scourging and all the crown of thorns and all the torture which Messiah, physical torture, which Messiah has gone through. When, if an amazingly conditioned athlete does that, he, he or she might last for about 10 to 10 to 12 minutes at the max. The strength of the legs would have given out within a short time. The weight of the body would have to be borne by the wrists. 
Engineers with experience in structural mechanics have tried to determine the amount of force placed on an individual in this position. It is estimated that with only a 10 degree angle, the arms drop about 10 degrees from horizontal. The forces that would be borne by a man weighing approximately 200 pounds would be more than one ton per arm socket. As a result, within a few minutes of being placed in the vertical position, the legs could no longer support the weight of the individual and his entire weight would have been placed on his arms. What does that do? Within minutes, the shoulders became become dislocated. Shoulder dislocation occurred when the upper arm bone, basically the humerus, was removed and pulled out of the socket. The weight would dislocate both of the elbows within a few minutes after that. As a result of the, these dislocations of the shoulders and the elbows, besides excruciating pain, the arms would have lengthened by six to nine inches. The process of crucifixion is in effect equivalent to the ancient me medieval torture, the rack in which they would stretch people until their bones are pulled out of joint. The tension that pulled upon the arms, the shoulders and the chest made it almost impossible to breathe. The victim hung in a position that forced inhalation. The victim needed to both inhale and exhale in order to breathe, right? which meant he would have to take the weight of his shoulders in order to exhale and breathe. And once again, dear brothers and sisters, please bear with us with the details. This is what Messiah is leading us to just understand, dear brothers and sisters, in our dimension, in our dimension, that what staggering, 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 what agony, just the physical agony what Messiah went through. We truly don't think through the process what just the physical aspect, what happened on that Roman cross. We truly don't think through these days, dear brothers and sisters, because we don't understand the humiliation involved, the physical agony involved, the shame, spitting, scoffing, mocking, all the things combined together, what all it comes with. So in order now to breathe, the, the victim need to both inhale and exhale in order to breathe, right? So which meant the victim, Messiah, would have to take the weight off his shoulders in order to exhale and breathe. And the only way to do that was to push down with his feet. This meant the man on the cross had to repeatedly push down on the nail embedded between his metatarsals in his feet, lift himself up and relieve the weight of his shoulders, then sink back down. And of course, this caused the nail to tear upward through the flesh between the metatarsal bones until it could go no further. Every breath was a struggle because the legs were severely weakened by being pinned down at 45 degrees angle. The process was a cruel cycle in which the person took Smaller and smaller breaths as he slowly suffocated to death. A series, a series of catastrophic physiological effects took place during crucifixion. First, the victim could not maintain adequate ventilation of the lungs. So his blood oxygen levels began to diminish and the cells began to be oxygen starved. Every cell needs oxygen to survive, right? So... That's what the blood does. That's what the arteries do when they deliver the blood to the cells and they get their oxygen and then the blood returns once again, the deoxygenated blood to our heart. And then once again, it gets oxygenated and on goes the artery, artery and the vein cycle. When the cells begin to the oxygen starts. This is called hypoxia, as a matter of fact. So carbon dioxide is a poison that our lungs want to get out, right? But because exhalation was difficult, so carbon dioxide levels begin to rise. The direct result was that the heart started to beat faster. The heart wants to pump oxygen to the cells and it wants to get rid of the carbon dioxide. So the heart started to beat faster and faster and faster to correct this metabolic imbalance. However, the victim still could not supply the heart with oxygen it needed, could not get adequate breath. 
breaths in and out and the rising heart rate only increases the oxygen demand and it would have been a vicious vicious cycle the heart kept pumping harder and harder to get more oxygen but oxygen but more oxygen was not available and so next the lungs began to collapse a collapsed lung is called as the fancy scientific term is pneumothorax so it takes place when the lungs collapse it takes place when there is a build up of air in the pleural space between the lung and the chest the collapsed lung now would no longer function correctly and oxygen delivery would have become even worse the heart would even beat faster and faster so we see this tachycardia now going on the rapid heart rate increase the pressure in the pulmonary arteries the arteries that go to the lungs pressure would have built up coupled with the collapsing of the lungs these things would have caused a build up of fluid in the cavity around the lungs some sometime which something is called as pleural effusion in in biomedical science so both chest cavities now can fill up to a gallon of fluid now this fluid has to come from somewhere where does it come from it comes from the blood vessels the blood is basically made of the blood cells floating in liquid in a liquid called plasma as the pressure increases the fluid from the blood would have gone into the victim's chest cavity which means that it left the blood stream and the body of the crucified man became increasingly more dehydrated because that fluid was no longer usable and the dehydration stressed the heart even further as it tried to pump less fluid blood which caused the heart rate to increase to a maximum rate of 200 to 220 beats per minute and of course we know that about seven, between 70 and 72 is the normal heart rhythm for per minute so this gives us a tragic physiological picture the victim's heart begin to beat begin to beat as fast as it could go and because it could not get enough oxygen and other nutrients it begins to fail this process would increase the fluid in the pericardial sac that surrounds the heart now the victim suffered both a pleural effusion and a pericardial effusion which inhibited the heart function even further the result of this dehydration would have caused the victim to experience tremendous thirst this is why despite the physical pain of the scourging and the cross and the nails and the suffocation messiah was experiencing messiah cried out at john as john apostle john records in john 1928 i thirst i thirst the combination of collapsing lungs a failing heart dehydration and the ability to get an adequate oxygen supply to the tissues to the cells all these things spiraled until they eventually caused the death of the victim some scientists as a matter of fact believe that the process of cru crucifixion which is so hard on the heart may actually have caused some victims to experience a cardiac rupture where the heart muscle itself actually tears up when that occurred death might have arrived within 6 minutes the romans didn't necessarily want death to come quickly to the victims of crucifixion because one of the things that the romans did to slow the process was to put a small wooden seat on the vertical timber of the cross which allowed the victim the privilege of bearing his weight on his bottom instead of bearing the weight on his feet so this small block could extend the lives of some sufferers for up to 9 days but messiah yeshua hamashiach or adonai however died in about 6 hours messiah's death was expedited by the fact that he was so severely beaten and he was already dehydrated and near death when they put him on the cross messiah also suffered incredible emotional and spiritual agony compounding the stress on his lungs and heart even beyond that of the normal crucifixion victim and of course when the romans wanted to expedite the process of death of an individual they would simply break his legs the person could not push up to take a breath and he would suffocate within 5 to 6 minutes and die so messiah died before that time came however we see that the roman soldiers did come to check on messiah but they didn't bother to break his legs Messiah's trials lasted the night and he was crucified at about 9 a.m. So by about 3 in the afternoon Messiah had been on the cross for what about 6 hours so Messiah had suffered an unimaginable trauma to his body 
His heart was failing. His lungs were failing. The pain is unimaginable. His hands are paralyzed. His feet are in horrible pain. The skin on his back and possibly the whole body is torn apart, is ripped apart, is mangled. And Messiah cried out, It is finished. Tetelestai. And he gave up the spirit. When the soldiers came to Messiah to break his legs, they found that he was already dead. And again, this fulfilled the prophecy that was that not a bone of his would be broken as the Passover lamb. The soldiers pierced him in the side and both blood and water from his pleural and pericardial effusions poured out. It wasn't the nails once again, dear brothers and sisters. It wasn't the nails that held him to the cross. It was his profound agape love for you and me. Just staggering, just staggering, just staggering. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We just praise you, we just praise you, we just praise you, Lord. Messiah and Messiah alone truly can do this, dear brothers and sisters. And there are scholars and, and there are theories always to disprove the cross, isn't it? There's a theory, I believe, that's called the swarm theory. There are those who suggest that Messiah did not die on the cross. They said that he was taken off the cross unconscious but alive. And that he was revived by the cool air in the tomb. They suggest that after a couple of days, Messiah unwrapped himself, got up and moved that giant two to three ton stone and sneaked by those 15, 16 Roman soldiers. And 12 of whom were awake and four asleep according to their shifts. Not only this, but he appeared to his disciples in great shape. This scenario is, of course, ridiculous and ignores everything about the nature of crucifixion. If a man today were put through the events and processes that Messiah, our Lord, our Adonai, Yeshua HaMashiach suffered, it is almost certain that he would not survive even with an expert trauma team standing next to them, standing, standing by. If a crucifixion victim were taken into the emergency room of a top-rate hospital, he would be on a respirator, in respiratory failure with pulmonary edema and a variety of other severe lung conditions. He would be in cardiac failure requiring emergency open heart surgery to close the wound in his heart from the spear in his side. Messiah did not have a surgical team in near vicinity. Scrubbed up and ready to go. No. It is incredibly insane to suggest that he unwrapped himself and pushed the stone aside. Because it is important to remember that Romans were expert executioners. They knew a dead man when they saw one. When the Roman soldier thrust his spear into the side of Messiah, water and blood came out, which suggests that his Messiah's pericardial sac and heart were pierced. It's also an indication that he was already dead. Because when a person dies, the blood in the veins, no longer being pumped, now will separate into the two components, the plasma and the red blood cells. So piercing through the heart or even passing through the lungs would have caused both a yellow fluid and a red blood to come out. This process in which the plasma and the blood cells separate is something that only occurs after death. Indeed, Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth died on that cross in Judea some 2000 years ago. Somebody had to die for you and me. Today we have the audacity to go and say, when are you coming, Lord? Why are you not coming? Why are you? We don't even understand. Do we, dear brothers and sisters? We don't even understand the great mercy of our great God, his loving kindness. We start to think that this is all merited because I do this, this, this. I have this church resume, the building church resume going on. So Messiah Hashem is happy with me because I am better than Sally, I am better than Harry, I am better than Susie, I am better than Andrew. Doesn't matter. We could never, we all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. It's not just a corporate death. Messiah died individually for you and me. He thought of you and me above all. But the good news for us today is that three days later, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Yeshua HaMashiach, rose again from the dead. To many, it seems foolish to look to a Jewish carpenter who died 2,000 years ago. 
for deliverance. Many people today refuse to look to Messiah for their salvation because they think the message, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power, power of God, power of Hashem, power of our great God and Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. The Bible says that the cross is foolishness to only those who are perishing. There are many people, unfortunately, today that they think I'm okay. I'm not that bad. And when I die, I, when I have a meeting with God, we will discuss the situation and my good deeds will overweigh, overpower my bad deeds. And I will be okay. I'll save myself. I'm not going to look at to that hanging person, to that person hanging the Jewish carpenter on a cross. Or... We just confess and it has the, the power of the cross does not transcend in our life. We just, it is all just an acknowledgement because my great grandfather did that. My grandfather did that. And it's an acknowledgement. It's a traditional thing going on. And the power of the cross has nothing to do with our lives. We just pursue our horizontal ambitions, goals, materialistic possessions. But yet I call myself a Christian. Trusting in Messiah is not foolish. The real foolishness is rejecting the sacrifice that Hashem made, made our Messiah made on our behalf. Messiah had to suffer and die that day on Calvary because there was no other way to salvation. Messiah and him alone took the judgment that you and I deserved. We deserved. And today is the day to truly surrender. Today is the day to truly Come to a great God in Lord. No matter where he, you have been. No matter how long it has been. Today is the day. Today is the day to experience the power of the cross of Calvary. Today is the day to get on our knees. Today is the day once again. To ask our holy heavenly father. Show us. Reveal to me more about the cross. The power of the cross of Calvary. Today is the day. The Bible says, For God so loved the world, for Hashem so loved the world, that Hashem gave His only begotten Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, that whosoever believes in Yeshua HaMashiach should not perish, but have everlasting, everlasting, everlasting life. Life eternal with Yeshua HaMashiach. And the price the Creator Himself paid on that Roman cross by dying and excruciating death. Today is the day to truly come in Messiah's presence. Today is the day as we go through this week, as we go through this staggering week, the week of agony of agape love, eternity decided in six hours by our compassionate Creator on that Roman cross. It is time to truly think about the events, just the anatomical, physiological aspect of the cross. The biomedical aspects of the cross. It is our prayer, our heartfelt prayer, that we all will dwell on this biomedical aspects of the cross, the physical pain and agony. The creator of heaven and earth, the creator of metacosm, microcosm, and macrocosm, the creator of all we see and all we cannot see, who went through. He could have stopped it any moment, but he did not. Because if he would have, then we would be spending our eternity in the lake of fire. Such is our holy heavenly father's love for you and me. That he abandoned his only begotten son. Who is the only righteous person who walked planet earth. For you and me. Isn't that staggering dear brothers and sisters. Isn't that staggering. If this is not staggering. If this doesn't excite us. If this doesn't penetrate our hearts. Then there is nothing. No technology, no modern frontiers of science. There's nothing else which can penetrate our hearts because there is only one thing which can penetrate our hearts and that is the agape love, the staggering agape love, the magnitude of that love of our Holy Heavenly Father, of our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. We thank you so very much once again, all our dear fellow brethren, for being a part of this week, for being a part of the week of a Week of agony of agape love. Eternity decided in six hours by our compassionate creator on that Roman cross. We thank you so very much once again for joining us for together once again honoring, glorifying and exalting our Redeemer Yeshua HaMashiach. 
who went through incredible, incredible extremes so that one day you and me can be in his presence so that one day we can truly hold hands together in Messiah's presence, prostrate, lie down and worship him at his feet. What a privilege, what a privilege. And today, let us end with a short word of prayer. Shall we, David? Yes. All right, you can please go ahead. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your death. And I thank you, Lord, for your staggering love for us, Lord. And bless all our viewers, Lord, and help them, Lord, to keep meditating on the cross, Lord, and on your staggering death, Lord. And as we come to the end of this message, help us, Lord, to be in your presence, Lord, and bless all our viewers, Lord, and empower them, Lord. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Once again, thank you so much, David, for praying for us. We thank you so very much. Once again, all of your fellow brethren for being a part of this week, the staggering week, the week that changed our eternity, the week of agony, of agape love, eternity decided in six hours by your compassionate creator on that Roman cross. Thank you so very much once again, all of your fellow brethren for viewing us and for being a part of a spiritual family. And let us truly contemplate, meditate on the biomedical aspects, the anatomical and physiological aspects, what happened, what happened on that Roman cross some 2000 years ago. Thank you, dear brothers and sisters, and may Lord God Almighty bless each and every one of you in abundance, and may Hashem lead you to the paths of His righteousness for His greater glory. Thank you, and God bless you all. Shalom.